Here we go. So welcome everyone. I'm still gonna give just a couple more minutes. We uh, blasted this out to our networks because we're really looking for new people, people who have not yet um, really made that step into connecting with their reps and senators and um, understanding the process and uh, figuring out, you know, just how important their voice can be. So, so thank you so much for joining us. And I, ha I do have a couple of people on here who um, are not new to the process. So definitely feel free to jump in and add your um, experience whenever possible. I think I'm going to start sharing my slides and then I can introduce myself to everyone. I think Katerina is here uh, to help me with letting people in. So that's awesome. Thank you, Katerina. Well, there we go. All right, well, I think I'll get started since we really have a, a really full agenda today. And I'm really excited. I see so many names of people that I don't know, which is great. Normally on my updates uh, monthly, I have a lot of the same folks uh, waiting to get updates. And this is kind of much more of an introduction um, for folks that really haven't been involved in legislative advocacy before. So um, we're, we're calling all the newbies today. Um, and so if you don't know me, my name is Mara Sullivan, and I'm the Senior Director of Government Affairs and Health Policy for the ARC of Massachusetts. I've been here for about a decade. I'm also the Director of Operation House Call, and Operation House Call is a medical student and nursing student training program, um, which helps uh, young doctors and nurses and other health professionals feel more comfortable, confident, um, in treating patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities and autism. And I explained that program a little bit because um, I'll use it as an example today uh, because this year we actually passed legislation to codify that program. Um, and it's an interesting example because it was 10 years of advocacy to get that one done. <laughs> so um, we'll also have examples of other legislation and initiatives that, that happened a lot quicker. Um, but just thought that was a good anecdote to throw in there. Uh, I also am a registered lobbyist, so I understand the process at the State House. Um, and I also represent advocates for autism of Massachusetts at the State House on their priorities. Um, and I think everybody knows this webinar is being recorded. So just in terms of logistics and housekeeping, um, if you have a burning question or something to add, please just unmute and, and shout out to me. I'm not gonna be able to see your hands up necessarily um, while I have my slides up. Um, so if I'm not recognizing you, just feel free to unmute or please put your questions in the chat and I promise I will leave time at the end um, to review everybody's questions. But I know sometimes it feels like you just need it answered um, at that time. So feel free, feel free to unmute. And hopefully um, Katerina might also be monitoring a bit there. All right, great. So let's jump in. For those of you who are not familiar with the ARC of Massachusetts, we are uh, an advocacy organization, of course, and we represent over 200,000 families and individuals in, in Massachusetts with intellectual and developmental disabilities and autism. And today I'm gonna use IDD really just so to save myself some time. Um, and our mission is to enhance the lives of people with IDD and autism and their families. And we do it through advocating for community services and supports that foster social inclusion, self-determination and equity across all aspects of society. Um, and the only way, this is a great mission, it really is. And the way that we really are able to meet this mission is um, 
through all of the voices in our community. And, and my job really is to amplify your voices um, at the state house and with our, our leaders. Um, but the most powerful thing that we can get is, is to have you do that yourself. So your voice is really the most important um, and the most impactful way that we can meet this mission. Just a little bit more about what the ARC does. So um, we work on, and we'll go through this a little bit more, um, the budget, the state budget that supports the programs and the services um, that are out there for people with autism and, and IDD and their families. Um, so that budget includes the Department of Developmental Services budget, which you know you may or may not know includes many line items like family support, um, like residential employment, day and employment. Um, it includes the line item for people with autism, with no intellectual disability, um, many other line items, transportation, really important things to people. So that's an annual process where we gather information up data about how many people are gonna be needing these services, um, what's currently happening in our community, if there are wait lists. Um, we look at diagnoses, increases, things like that to influence how we advocate for the budget. Um, but really the most powerful thing that we'll talk about around our advocacy is um, uh, telling the stories of the people in our community and having you tell your story because those stories make the budget line items real. They make those line items come to life for the legislators and, and for lawmakers. Um, so we're gonna talk a lot about storytelling. Um, and so the other big thing that we work on is legislation. And, and some of you are aware, we have a pretty large uh, platform, a bill platform that you can find, and we'll talk about how to find that. Um, but these bills kind of span a really broad um, area of legislation for us. And um, we'll talk about the process of bills going through the state house and how it's a two year process and how they all, you know, go to hearing and um, and right now we're actually at a point where we really need your voice on our bills. So we're going to talk about how to how to jump in and get involved with that. And then these are all the other areas um, that the ARC focuses on uh, policy issues, um, statewide and federal, Medicaid or Mass Health, as you know, it um, and our programs like Operation House Call, and then like what we're doing today, citizen empowerment. We are really focused on getting our community active and involved. Okay. So what are we gonna cover today? Um, we're gonna talk more about legislative advocacy and empowerment. Um, we're gonna try to simplify the process. And I say that tongue in cheek, I guess, because it's not a simple process, um, but I'm going to break it down. And um, Katerina and I were talking before um, this started today, and we said, this is definitely, think of this as part one. Um, and then after the holidays, we will have a part two, and then probably a part three, When and it will be great timing, because we'll be at the end of the session, and we'll really need, um, you know, advanced advocacy skills coming on board. So um, something we'll talk about that I think is the crux of all of this is understanding um, the importance of relationship building, social change, everyday change you can make in your community, um, and the power of storytelling. And then we're going to zip through the budget because I think the budget and the bill process will probably be more in part two, but leave time for Q&A as well. I'm just gonna keep going until I hear any questions or, or someone uh, interrupts me. So let's start uh, really at the basics. What is advocacy? I'm sure everybody out there can define this for me. Um, clearly communicating an issue or a cause to educate or persuade legal or social change. And this can be one-to-one -one or it can be mobilizing thousands. 
which the ARC does both of those things. Sometimes our advocacy is, is just one-to-one. -one. Um, sometimes your advocacy will be just one-to-one. -one. And then other times we need to mobilize um, with numbers. And um, you'll see examples of both of those. But this is really the very, very basic definition of advocacy, right? Um, we all know advocacy means much, much more than this. And successful advocacy takes all of these things. Um, I'm sure all of you have been advocates in your lifetime. You have had to advocate for yourself, for um, your child in their school, um, just across, across the board. So you could probably add quite a few things to this list. If you have more ideas on what successful advocacy takes, throw them in the chat and I'll add them to my next presentation. Um, but I think doing this job for as long as I have um, and being an advocate for my own kids, um, I would say dogged determination is, su is super important. Um, there's no giving up. Uh, it comes with um, determination and patience kind of hand in hand, right? We also know that that crisis, tragedy, and celebrity can influence advocacy. So um, when a celebrity, you know, has an issue, it, it's, it's going to be elevated because people hear about it in the media um, can really be powerful in those in those situations. Um, something that we focus a lot on is, is grassroots and getting numbers of people to voice their concerns. Um, and that also kind of factors into the work we do with coalitions as well. That's big numbers. Um, our coalitions are sometimes individuals and sometimes they are coalitions of other advocacy organizations. Um, but the numbers definitely count. And then the bolded stories and lived experience. I, I bold stories and relationships because I think that that is the real key um, to learning how to be a good advocate. And the stories don't have to be your stories. I mean, you can be someone who's working in the field and has the stories of the people that you work for. Um, you can be advocating um, for a cause but learn the stories and understand them. And, and if they are your stories, learn how to tell them concisely and powerfully. Um, let me do a quick check to see if the chat, if that's a question in the chat. Yes, that's it. Jossie says, improvising, taking advantage of opportunities. That's a huge piece. And I, I don't know if I have that in any of my slides, but the ARC, um, we have a large build platform, like I said, but sometimes we're going to wait and see what moves, what's happening at the state house that we can latch on to. Like, for example, the governor um, put out a housing bill just recently. So we're going to look at all our housing legislation and see how we can maybe move our legislation into her bill. Now, that's that's for part three advocacy, but um, but that's a really good point, Jesse. Um, so I, I put down legislative leverage, which might not make sense, but we we really look to legislators um, who are leaders, who can really move things, who are well respected, um, probably maybe a chairman or um, someone else in leadership as people who can take a bill that's close and help us get it over the line. Um, so all of these other things, we'll talk a little bit more about media because uh, you all can be involved in that um, through social media, through your local papers, through writing letters to the editor and using any other media connections you have. I mean, we all have connections and, you know, getting on the news nowadays can be so helpful. We can not just have that that um, TV appearance, but then we can share that link over and over and it and it for for good reason it makes an impact it reaches a wide wide audience um so yeah so if anyone has other things add them in there and i'll check them out later well i also like to talk a little bit about social change because um i don't think legislative advocacy is effective without social change and um, you can force legislative advocacy, but it takes longer to change attitudes and beliefs. Um, and the best way we can do that 
is through our everyday relationships. And that's um, a very powerful way to transform culture. So that's connecting with your neighbors um, who may not know about issues in the disability community or any of the issues that might be important to you um, that you think need to be changed in this world. Um, it, it's connecting with people, it's telling your story, and it's it's building those, those connections in our community and those same connections with your legislators. They're your neighbors too. Um, so movements like deinstitutionalization is an example of both legal and social movement. There's many, many others. There's um, Black Lives Matter and, and gay marriage and throw some more in the chat if you can think of them. But these are these are movements that has have taken legal change, um, legislation, and also really require um, that social change piece, that attitude adjustment. And we still really need that because here, you know, our community, we're still facing bias. And speaking of bias, um, yeah. There's a lot of work to be done. The barriers are still there and some of them are deeply embedded. We call that systemic bias or institutional bias. And other barriers are, are unheard voices. It's, it's really hard for the disability community to be heard. We, you know, we're all really busy as parents and um, as, as people just trying to, you know, kind of get by in our lives. Um, and to take the time to, you know, really um, be present in, in a political environment is not always easy. Um, the ARC is here to try to make that easier, to really make um, stepping up and, and getting your voice heard um, not such a challenging process. Funding is something that, you know, we've struggled with for, for many forever. So we're going to keep needing more funding. There's more people with disabilities. There's more need out there. Um, and we really know there's a lack of education. And I'll talk a little bit more about that er around my experience with talking with legislators and sometimes how they really just didn't know something. And without knowing about it, that's really hard for them to care. Um, so it's kind of this idea that don't think that everyone knows your story or knows about what's happening um, to your family because they really oftentimes don't. Um, so how do we engage society and get people listening? Uh, sometimes we have to really undo assumptions, right? Even our own assumptions. Sometimes we get a step back and think about, you know, we're immersed in our own issues, but we probably have bias ourselves in certain areas. Um, so thinking about undoing assumptions and always making room at the table for meaningful inclusion is one way, is a couple of ways that we're gonna break down these barriers. All right, so where where do we begin? Um, I'm, I'm thinking of all of you guys as people who just haven't yet made that connection or maybe you did a long time ago and you haven't done it again. Um, and it's absolutely nothing to be intimidated by. I think, you know, the takeaways here that I'll go over at the end are is nobody expects you to be an expert in any of the legislative process or um, the timing on things or, you know, a bill number. None of those things really matter. Um, what you are an expert in is is your own story, your own needs. And the only thing we need from you is to be that voice. Um, so don't be intimidated. Uh, what's really nice is you, you, you can just be a beginner. You can say, hey, I'm reaching out for the first time and this is new to me. Um, and I may need some help along the way to understand the process, but I want to introduce myself and I want to tell you about what I need from you. And I want to tell you about my family or about my own situation. Um, and I tell uh, you will get a really positive and supportive response. So the two places where I would start is the ARCS Advocacy Take Action page or find my legislator on masslegislature.gov. 
um, you're going to get these slides. So you don't have to write anything down. But if you haven't been on our Take Action um, page, go to that page, scroll down. You can put in your address. It'll give you who, well, it'll give you everyone from the president all the way to your rep, your local rep and senator. So scroll all the way down. You'll see your Massachusetts representative and your Massachusetts senator. Um, this page is a page we want you to be familiar with anyway. This is where you can visit often to see what action alerts we have up. Um, and those are kind of the simplest way to connect with your legislator. So we're going to circle back to action alerts later, but feel, feel comfortable with the arc of mass backslash advocacy. There's a lot of information on there, um, but you know, go through it slow. You're going to have a budget section, there's a bills section, and then the take action section. Those are kind of the three I would recommend, you know, be getting familiar with. And then, you know, the masslegislature.gov, it, it's more of a homework assignment. It's something to get familiar with over time, right? So um, go on. You're gonna, you can also find your legislator there under find my legislator. And um, you can start to get comfortable with the kind of the, how they outline the budget process, really get to know your legislator on massledge.gov. You'll see what, what uh, committees they're involved in, if they're in leadership, if they're a chair of a committee, what bills are important to them. Um, so this is a, a really great tool to get familiar with. Oh, thank you, Katarina, for putting it in there. Um, Maura. So yeah, yes. Jen Bergrand here from the MD. Hi. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I guess, you know, if you're an individual or parent and maybe you're new to taking the step into your advocacy journey and leadership journey, I think it's important to know that these elected officials, we oftentimes put them up on a pedestal, right? But these are people that put their pants on one leg of, at a time, just like we do. And they really need to know what you know. So you they can develop, you know, responsible policies. Um, they Not everybody's lives are touched by disability in the ways that our lives are. And, you know, in the small part of humanity, you truly are the experts and you have something valuable to offer them. So I guess I would just keep that in mind, you know, as you reach out and and I hope that it helps you to be less intimidated because they're just people like you and me. Oh, I love that, Jennifer. Thank you so much for adding that. And I want to go back. I want to go back to something that you were talking about earlier about social change, because one thing one way you can connect, in essence, with your neighbors or your legislators is recognizing their issues that are intersectional. So you may have someone, for instance, who doesn't have an experience with disability, but they're interested in an economic issue, for instance, that could have an impact on disability. So you can connect on that on that level. Or for instance, black even a, a racial ethnicity. There are a lot of, a lot of issues that are intersectional. For oh instance, like home and community-based services, for instance. I mean, home and community-based services, that's what would allow people with disabilities to not live in institutions, but to live in the community. To invest, for the government to invest in that, that would benefit people with disabilities, but it would also benefit people who serve people with disabilities, who, for mm -hmm. instance, would get a higher rate, rage, get more respect, it may, you know, to have have better better quality of life. So there's an intersectional thing. You know. Jossie, that's absolutely brilliant. Yes, so, so important. I'm adding that to my slides for next time. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, so so the outreach and introduction, it, it can be it can be by phone, you can call the office and and just introduce yourself and say you'd like to set up a meeting. Um, you can have a, sometimes a, a rep or a senator will set up a phone call with you. Nowadays, there's this option of virtual meetings. Um, also, a very common way to, to meet is in the district. They will have district hours, so you can drop by there and introduce yourself. Um, and at this point, with your outreach and introduction, you don't have to necessarily have an ask. Um, you're really setting up the relationship. And you can certainly tell your story at this time. Um, you know, the, the things that are important to you, the things that keep you up at night. This is a, a good time to just really introduce yourself and, and learn about them. 
the likelihood um, is also that you might first meet with staff. You know, they might say, oh, I'd love to take a meeting with you. You know, the representative is two or three weeks out, um, which is fine. Getting to know the staff is is really important. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, about kind of the structure of the staffing. because that can be a little bit confusing, too. Um, this is our chair of healthcare finance, Senator, Senator Cindy Feingold. Uh, yeah, Feingold. Um, and she, no. Friedman, sorry, got two senators mixed up. And she um, she's also the vice chair of Ways and Means. Um, so it's also really important when you find out who is your rep and who is your senator, are they actually in leadership? Because that's uh, a very important piece for the ARC to know. And when you're, when you're um, advocating, um, wow, the impact is a lot greater when they're in a, a position of of elevated power, really. Um, so back to, to the structure. So for someone like Cindy Friedman, she has a large staff because she has a committee that she's in, in charge of, which has, you know, hundreds of bills that go through that committee. Um, so you might get, there, there would definitely be a district person um, who handles any kind of local district issues there would be a chief of staff that you might talk to, um, a legislative director, and that's sometimes the person that we um, connect with the most on our bills, things like that. Um, there can be a budget director, there can be legal counsel um, or committee staff that you might end up talking to. So there are a lot of folks in some of these offices. Other reps and senators, um, they're not in charge of a committee. They may just, they may even just have one staff or two. Um, so it's a range depending, but really feel comfortable getting to know the staff, ask them their names, write down their names. So you can, when you call, you can ask by name who you wanna talk to. Um, and really these are the people that can help us a whole lot on moving our priorities forward. So, set, so getting the relationships going with them is key. Um, like I said, there's lots of meeting options. Um, I think I put this five to 10 calls will make an impact. That's not you calling five to 10 times. That's, you know, when a, when a rep or a senator hears from a constituent um, or their staff takes a call from a constituent, and then they hear from five or 10 more on the same issue. Um, and that's not a lot of people. But that will get them looking into that issue more. That will get them uh, involved. So, um, so your one call around an issue can really be part of that, you know, picture. And so, don't think it won't make a difference. It really, really can. Sometimes we get, you know, thousands of people to write letters. Um, probably less calls go in, so it's something to think about um, doing more often. So, um, so after you've reached out and you've had a meeting and you've introduced yourself, your family, which we'll, you know, talk about how important that piece is, um, you know, I think the next steps really involve relationship building. Um, you know, maybe you uh, go to the office, maybe you bring um, your loved one, you bring a family member, you bring your neighbor, um, you uh, connect with the rep and senator on social media and support them. You know, look at what they're doing, give them a like, give them a comment, um, even if it's not related to the disability community issues. Um, but on your own issues, or um, if you're trying to get a meeting and it hasn't been set up, you, you just can't give up. One call is not gonna do it. Um, these are really busy people. And when we talk about not, you know, being intimidated, sometimes when people don't hear back, either they get, you know, mad or they feel intimidated. And the point is, you know, they have thousands of pieces of legislation and, you know, hundreds of constituents um, calling and wanting their time. So, you know, the squeaky wheel is definitely part of this. Um, and then once you do have them connected to your issue and um, and they know, you know, why you're calling and and whether it's because, you know, your your the workforce is important to you 
whether you're um, really worried about, you know, employment opportunities or, um, you know, any of any of the issues that might be coming up for you, you need to hold them accountable. Um, you want them, oops, typo there, to prioritize your concerns. So one of the struggles we we have, and I hear it often, is I talk to my rep, I talk to my senator, they're they very nice, very supportive of my issue. They're really sorry that my son or daughter or that I don't have the services and supports that I need. Um, but that's where it ends, right? They're not taking that next step to say, how can I help? What can I do? Um, and what they can do, which is really powerful, is they can bring your concerns up the chain, right? So that so that's what we do when we're asking, you know, for support um, from you to your legislator. What we really want to see is your legislator bring it to leadership. So say we want to increase the rates of pay for the workforce, um, and we have a bill to do that, or a budget line item that's that's focused on that. Um, we need your rep and senator to make that like one of their top three priorities and bring it to leadership. Because if your rep and senator does that and, you know, a hundred of the other reps and senators do that, then we're, we're going to see our issues prioritized and potentially passed. Um, so it's sort of a funnel concept, right? And so the more people you can get to affect your rep or senator, um, the more likely is he, he or she is going to take that issue up the chain. I think I overdid that, but yeah. Um, and again, so where where do you get all of the passion that you need, right, to keep doing this? And this is not your full-time job, and you're going to have to be squeezing this in around your life, right? And I know how hard it is. Um, for me, Obviously, um, you know, these are my kids and my two sons, Neil and Tyler, who are young adults now. Um, they they give me the inspiration and the lived experience that we have as a family uh, truly helps strengthen my advocacy. Right. Um, so find your passion, find your personal passion um, and get ready to tell your story. Uh, stories help us connect. They reveal the details um, and the impact of the system on our daily lives. As I said before, and Jennifer said it too, you know, these some of these uh, lawmakers they really just don't know. And I'll give an example of um, of universal changing tables. Uh, when we picked up this bill as a priority for the ARC. So that's an, a, a changing table that's meant for anyone from an infant to an adult. Um, and when we spoke to one of the uh, reps that we are close to about this, his response was, oh my God, I never thought of this before. And I would never have thought of it. So even if I walk by an infant or a toddler changing table 10 times, I wouldn't have thought in my head, what about people with disabilities who are bigger than toddlers and infants? Thank you for bringing this to me. Um, even in, in that story alone, when we had our hearing for this, some wonderful reps were testifying about needing um, infant changing tables in men's rooms and family restrooms, right? Because no longer just happens that mom changes a, a diaper. Um, and when they finished testifying and then we testified for the, for the adult or the universal changing table, it was like their minds were blown. Like, wow, how do we miss this, right? Um, so it's really, it's really important that we tell our stories. Um, like I said before, if it's a budget line item, it's a line item to these lawmakers until they hear your story. And this is another example of where intersectionality could come in because it wouldn't just be older adults with disabilities. It could be people with Alzheimer's disease, for instance. Absolutely. And, and, demographic. 
Yeah, exactly. And I need to do a better job bringing in that intersectionality into my advocacy as well. Um, so when you give them your lived experience, it starts to shift implicit bias. They can start to see, they can put their own feet in your shoes a little bit more. Um, so that's the importance of stories, I think, on that level. But there's a whole nother level about storytelling that, you know, it's really interesting and, and important for us to embrace. Um, there was a, a researcher um, at Princeton named Yuri Hansen, and um, he did some research where he he put people in functional MRIs where they were awake and you could see areas of their brain lighting up. Um, he had them have typical conversations and, you know, their memory areas of their brains were not lighting up at all. Um, but when they began to tell stories, the person who was listening to the story brain lit up all over, especially the memory areas of the brain. Um, we are evolutionarily programmed to learn from each other through storytelling. Um, and we know that it truly um, causes better concentration. People forget data. They they hear it and it goes, you know, in one ear and out the other. Um, so one story is greater than 10 million pieces of data. Now, uh, that said, from, from a policy perspective, I think you really need both. But if you want to make an impact, it's all about your story. Um, and that's what's going to stick with people. When we have hearings and there's a large committee sitting up there um, listening to, you know, potentially a hundred people come up and, and give testimony you want them to leave that night and in the car driving home, remember your story. Um, and, and that's how you're going to do it, just, you know, by really giving those details. Um, some of you have heard uh, a lot about my son, Neil, and he is uh, someone who teaches me every day. So I try to use some examples around Neil. And, you know, we're very, very focused on increasing the pay for our direct support work staff. Um, and I think often of what it takes to to take care of Neil, that the level of staff, uh, the level of training um, that needs to happen versus the the rate of pay is just ridiculous. Um, people who take care of Neil have to learn a really complex medication routine. He has epilepsy and he can have a seizure if his meds aren't given in a timely way or if there's absolutely any mistakes in his meds. Um, he also has a lot of uh, GI issues. And if you don't stay on top of those, uh, the pain that he experiences um, is, is terrible. And not only that, it can cause him to have a lot of behavior challenges. Um, he is a, a, a non-speaking person and he uses an augmentative communication device. His is a, his way of using it is a little bit comp, a little bit challenging and he's uh, definitely got some individual ways of communicating. It takes a while to understand that and learn that um, and to be able to communicate back with him effectively. Um, he does have challenging behavior. It can be dangerous. He needs uh, someone who's really vigilant, who can see what might trigger Neil in the environment and be on top of that. They also need to know how to react when he does um, become unsafe to keep him safe and keep people around him safe. Um, this is a tough job. Sorry about that. Someone's at the door. Without effective uh, rates that will bring people into this job, um, you know, we are in a constant battle of, of losing staff, not retaining staff, needing to recruit and train. Um, and poor Neil, he just begins to bond with a staff person. It takes them a while. Um, and when they're good, it's wonderful. And they bond and they have trust and they begin to be friends. And then, you know, Target pays $2 more and that person is gone. Um, so we, I mean, from so many aspects, this is tragedy because then Neil has to adjust to a whole new person. Um, 
the provider staff has to retrain, um, you know, the, it's tough on everyone basically. Um, so this is a story that I often use because I don't know if, if people understand, you know, sometimes I think people think that this job is, is more babysitting and um, they don't understand how demanding, how intuitive and sorry, how, um, <laughs> how compassionate these folks need to be. All right. So moving on from stories, but, you know, start to think about, you know, the most effective way to tell your story. And, um, and so, so in terms of, you know, what might be your ask once you've made a connection with your legislator, once you know your rep and senator, um, and they know you, uh, what's the best way to start communicating with them about, you know, what you need from them? I would say the best thing you can do is make sure you're on our mailing list and you're following us on social media because we give you some really simple ways of connecting. Um, our action alerts give you all the details of any of the issues that we're advocating for within the action alert. So if you see that little blip come up um, where you can click on it and then uh, insert your name into the letter, um, definitely for one, do it, but read the letter. It's going to tell you everything you need to know, maybe print it, maybe save it, um, and then follow up after you send it and say, you know, I sent this letter. Now I'm calling to see um, if you received it and what you plan to do. And this is another place where, you know, really holding them accountable um, is, the, is key. Um, and, you know, Knowing the budget advocacy and the bill advocacy timeframes is important. Um, budget advocacy critical timeframe is January to June. So we're heading right into it. Now's the time, you know, to get involved. Um, we'll talk, if we have time, we'll go through the, the actual process. But our budget advocacy is for the workforce. It's for the Department of Developmental Services, for Mass Health Programs, for DESE. Um, so get on the mailing list, get comfortable with our advocacy pages. Um, the legislation uh, happens every two years and we are actually at the, um, the end or the middle to the end of our session. So between uh, now and June, end of June, we need to pass those bills that are important to us. And, you know, we do have a lot of bills that cover a broad area, as you can see. Okay, so when we talk about the timing, I just wanna give you a brief overview of what the budget process looks like. So during the fall, you know, the governor and administration and um, people on the fiscal side are determining the budget. Some of that is determined from what we utilized last year and many, many other factors. Um, and then the governor releases the budget, usually the third week in January. Last year was different because she was a brand new governor. She had a little extra time. Um, the budget, as she releases it, then goes to the House, and they are able to make changes in that budget. So when we see the governor's budget and we see gaps or areas that need increases, like the workforce, like community day and employment or transportation, um, or turning 22, then we will put together an ask and you will see that come out. It will be, you know, the ARCS budget ask. And, um, and we will engage our legislators or our champions in the legislature to file amendments to the governor's budget. And then we will ask you to get your legislator to support that amendment. So that's kind of the big uh, advocacy process um, from a from a, a constituent perspective. You're going to ask your legislator, your House representative, um, to sponsor or co-sponsor an amendment. Um, and then when the House budget comes out, the same thing happens on the Senate side. We look, what did the House do? What do we need the Senate to do? And who is going to champion that for us? And then the, the final piece really is uh, what the House did and what the Senate did, um, then combines and goes to the conference committee, which is a smaller group um, of three from the House and three from the Senate. 
and they uh, kind of decide what that final cha what the what changes in the budget from the governor's budget will um, be the final budget that will go back in front of the governor. Um, so there's lots of advocacy opportunity during this whole process. Um, and then the governor will take that final budget from the conference committee and she may veto it. She may accept it. She may make a lot of vetoes or small vetoes. The, uh, the legislature can then override those vetoes. So there's always advocacy processes going on where, you know, advocating for overrides um, and, and amendments all the way through this process. So I know that was really fast, but I just wanted to give you that quick overview. Um, and the same goes for legislation. New bills are filed, you know, uh, in January, and then they have that two-year cycle, or really year and a half, year and so many months cycle. Um, and our goal is to really get as many reps and senators to support our legislation as possible. And then when it goes to committee, we're looking for as many people to support it in writing with written testimony or um, by showing up or virtually testifying for the bills. Let me double check this quick. Um, is there an option to share our story with ARC advocates? Yes, that's definitely, a, we are always collecting stories um, and we're always willing to share your story as well. So um, you'll see on my last slide, I think I said to, you know, anytime you need help writing your story or um, you wanna just reach out to me, you know, that's my job is, is to help you um, tell your story, whether it's through the arc or, or individually. Um, so yeah, so I don't want to get too, like I said, we'll go into more detail in part two. Um, but just so you know where we are right now, all of our bills went to committee this year. We have, you know, 20 plus bills. Um, they all had hearings except for one is Monday. Um, and then our job right now is to to really push for those bills to be released from those committees. And this is just their initial committee. The bill went on to either uh, Ways and Means or another committee. Um, and that's where things get really tough. <laughs> that's where the, the, the advocacy needs to increase, um, I think, tenfold. And we'll be you know, blasting out action alerts and asking for your help um, because there are probably over a thousand bills that get to ways and means every year and, and very few bills actually get passed, right? Because of timing and prioritization. Um, so this is where, you know, we really need help. Maura. Yeah. I just was thinking back to some of the things you were saying about, you know, meeting your legislators and, you know, sometimes that can be really uncomfortable for folks, especially if you've never done it before. Um, there's this universal principle of persuasion. Um, it's called liking. And essentially what I guess research has shown is that people prefer to say yes to people they like or who cooperate with them. So I find it's really helpful. The first time I'm talking to my legislator or other lawmakers, I look for areas of similarities. I ask them questions. You know, one of my goals is to learn as much as I can about uh, that person and then identify those similarities. You know, I'll offer some genuine compliments, not over the top. You know, you, you can't be disingenuous in, in that um, conversation. And, you know, regardless of your political affiliation, even I found lawmakers that I share the same uh, political affiliation. I don't always agree with everything they agree with. Um, so I really try to sus suspend my judgment and, and really try to understand why they believe what they believe, how they, you know, why they voted, how they voted. But that's, I feel, is a really important part of um, being able to build a trusted relationship with them. If um, you're able to do that and they like you, it's much more um, likely that they'll cooperate with you and and help them. Absolutely. That's an excellent suggestion. Um, it, you know, definitely part of relationship building. So getting to know them, you'll get, if you follow them on social media, you'll start to see what's important to them too. Um, yeah. So we are asking a lot of our reps and senators. We need them to take the time to understand the issues, right? To really understand the issues, to hear our stories. 
um, to, to step up and be a co-sponsor or support, you know, a, a budget line item or to sponsor legislation. And then to like, you know, whatever is important to them to be able to fit in our priorities as well. Or maybe we get lucky and we have reps and senators who's, who's, disability is a high priority for them already. And there are a few of those for sure out there. We're so lucky. Um, and then being able to, you know, speak to leadership and, and highlight these needs. So again, this is just a, a little bit more on that funnel. So these are the folks that we need your reps and senators to bring the issues to. And maybe some of these folks are your reps and senators, um, which is great. Um, but they are really the, the decision makers in um, a lot of ways. So uh, that funnel of more and more and more reps and senators going to the House Ways and Means, or the more and more reps going to him, and more senators going to um, the Senate Ways and Means chair. Um, and then they bring it up to, to Senator Spilka and, and Representative Mariano. Um, so, so that's so, so important. And that's kind of the goal. Um, so, okay, I'm getting to wrap up because I want to take a few questions for sure. And um, ugh, I have a typo again. That's not Matt. It's not mass with two S's. It's M-A legislature.gov. Um, and the arc of mass, get comfortable there. Um, and the takeaways are really just now is the time, anytime is the right time to reach out. But uh, we re will really need you right now. So if you can get up to speed. Um, Within the next month or so, you'll see it, the whole process un, unraveling in January. Um, okay, so if you don't know everything, uh, don't worry. Like Jennifer said, this is, uh, you know, you are the expert in your own uh, story and what matters to you. So don't be discouraged. Um, and also keep learning more. You know, there's a lot to know about the process. Don't put it all on you on yourself, but, but be open to continue to learning. And, you know, like I heard from someone the other day, it was discouraged because she wanted to file a bill, but it's just not the right time to file right now. Um, it just wouldn't be as effective. Right. So, so having an understanding of the timeframes and the processes can help you like feel a little less discouraged, I guess. Um, and stay connected to the ARC and reach out for help and definitely sign up for our action alerts. Um, I'm going to skip by that and get to some questions because I would love to share that video, but I think people might have seen it already, but it's um, it's available on our YouTube and it's our, our Nikki's Law Abuser Registry video. That's a really nice um, summary kind of of what it looks like to try to pass legislation. <laughs> um, so, okay, so I want to take some questions and I didn't look in the chat, but it looks like people were pretty... Um, quiet in the chat. So anyone have any questions? I know it was a lot. We'll give you the recording and the slides. And again, reach out directly. Um, we have fact sheets for all of our bills. So if you're starting to look through the bills and you say, you know, this one's important to you or this one, just reach out and we'll get you the fact sheet. It helps you digest the bill a little bit better rather than trying to read the, you know, legal, the legal mumbo jumbo. All right, well, I really appreciate everybody's time today. Thank you so much for being here. And um, I hope everyone will join us for uh, part two um, and, and happy, happy holidays. Thanks, everybody. Happy holidays. Bye. Bye, Jossie. And thank you. And thank you, Jennifer, too. Thank you. Bye, Jennifer. Bye, everyone.